Welcome everybody to our final webinar of the 2020 Deep Learning for Science School program. We are uh, saving the best for last. We have uh, we're very we're very pleased to have <laughs> Zach Ulysses with us today. So Zach is an assistant professor of chemical engineering at Carnegie Mellon. He works on the development and application of high throughput computational methods in catalysis, machine learning models to predict their properties, and active learning methods to guide these systems. Applications include energy materials, CO2 utilization, fuel cell development, and additive manufacturing. Zach has been recognized for his work with awards such as the 3M Non-Tenure Faculty Award and the 35 Under 35 Award from the American Institute of Chemical Engineers. Uh, he's been a part of this, our community, the National Lab HBC communities for a while. He did his uh, PhD as a DOE CSGF fellow at MIT. And today, Zach is going to talk to us about representations for molecules, materials, and services, a topic that is of interest, I think, to a lot of us doing science here. So with that, Zach, I think you can take it away. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Stephen. And also thanks, Wahid and um, Mustafa, who's not on the call, for inviting me. Um, I was uh, excited when Mustafa asked if I wanted to give a talk on representations, because this is something that has been moving very quickly. And I found myself having trouble keeping track of what was going on in the field and what different people were doing. And so I'm really glad that uh, this was the um, the right impetus for me to sit down and organize things and think about what um, what everyone is working on. So one thing I want to mention first is that this is not the first talk in the in the summer school that talked about representations. And so Tess Schmidt, the uh, one of the Alvarez fellows at LBL, uh, gave an amazing talk on symmetry and equivariance in neural networks. Um, her slides are online. The video is also on the DL for Sci webpage. Hopefully, most of you saw that. A lot of the things that she talked about properties of models and properties of representations that are nice for um, physical systems will also apply here. Um, I don't think I'm going to go into quite as much detail as she did on exactly how the math of those transformations work, but they're very much aligned. And the work that um, she's talking about is really where I think a lot of the representations are heading and there's a lot of progress in that area. So I'll go over very briefly some of the things that she talked about, maybe a little bit closer to the end, but if you find yourself really asking, um, what should the ideal representation be or um, where is this field going in five years, I would go back and check her talk um, as a refresher. So one of the reasons why I think this area is so exciting is because um, so much is changing so quickly um, among these related um, problems. So in this talk, I want to talk about um, uh, three main classes of uh, materials and molecules. The first is small molecules. That's where a lot of things are being done for the first time. The second is inorganic materials, which are really important for a lot of energy applications. And they have their own set of challenges that I'll talk about. And the third in the upper right is a little picture is uh, catalysis and surface science, which is very related to the first two, but sort of combines both of the challenges. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. So um, on this slide, I did my best to try and um, reproduce what I've seen in literature. Um, I'm sorry if I missed um, something specific. Uh, what I've done is on the x-axis, I just plotted um, roughly when there seemed to be a burst of papers or when the seminal paper seemed to have been published for the area and for the type of material. On the y-axis, I have a qualitative breakdown on different types of representations that have been used. Some of these are a little bit blurry. So for example, um, as I'll talk about, atomic environments and graphs um, sort of overlap, and it's not always super clear which bin they should fall under, um, but there are some differences. And um, one thing that I find very interesting is that if you look at the x-axis, um, with the exception of small molecule fragment models, almost all of these are really 2005 to 2020. Um, and a lot of the newer ones, such as thinking about how to apply real space convolutions or orbitals as representations, those have really been in just the past five years. So I don't think I've ever um, put together a talk that has as many links to archive as I have in this, um, in this one today, 
just because so many things are moving so quickly and um, there's so many papers and so many things going on. So it's very exciting. Um, at the same time, it's a little bit overwhelming because when we sit down with our system of interest, whatever we're trying to do, um, we have to make a choice for where we're going to start and what class of materials we're going to go for. So for example, if I have a, um, if I have a student join my group and we're talking about how to try and solve some problem, um, I might give some idea on which of these qualitative things they should think about and they'll sit down and research the area and play with their data and apply some models. But the high level perspective of what is really the best and how are things moving um, has been very, very difficult to keep track of. Um, and it can make a really large difference in the sort of uh, behavior that you get out. Um, I think as, as Tess sort of showed, um, in some cases, uh, very subtle changes in the models of the representations can have very large impacts and what sort of uh, behavior you can, you can see. Okay, so uh, today what I wanna do is first talk about um, why there are different challenges in small molecules, materials, and surfaces. And each of those subfields have their own issues and questions. And the way that they think about the world impacts the way that they represent things. And so if we don't understand where they're coming from or what challenges they're trying to solve, we're not gonna be able to get the context for why they're using different types of models. The second thing um, is I wanna talk a little bit about how to uh, quantitatively um, compare different representations. And there's some, been some very interesting work on different um, ways of analyzing, especially as you go to larger and larger data sets to see how they're learning and how powerful is the representation. Um, then I'll go through each of these different qualitative representation classes that I just showed in the previous slide. And then at the very end, um, very briefly, I'll talk about um, some recent work that has been coming out on how to automatically try a lot of these representations and find the one that works best for your system. Like most auto ML things, it works sometimes, but is not always the best. Um, and then a little bit of a future outlook and, and where I think there is progress and where I think there needs to be some development in order to enable some new areas. Okay, so I wanna start with small molecules because that's really where a lot of these representations are coming from. So uh, the things that govern small molecules are really um, uh, mostly models of simple hydrocarbon systems or oxygenates. So these are small molecules. By that, I mean usually less than 20 heavy atoms. A heavy atom is anything that's not a hydrogen. Um, usually it's either carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. Sometimes you also have sulfur in there. Um, the space is pretty overwhelming. So there was a really well-known work in about 2010 that brute force enumerated every small molecule under 17 heavy atoms. And with that brute force enumeration, you're already at 160 billion possible molecules. So that's wild. Um, 17 isn't even as high as you go, right? It would be very easy to add more things onto this uh, molecule in the upper right. So um, this is really a combinatorial space. If you add in any sort of metal center or you start talking about, um, for example, sulfur, I don't think that was in the original one, um, that gets very, very complicated very quickly. At the same time, um, the number of elements that are considered with these small molecules is very small. So like I said, um, really it's focused on CNO, SH, sometimes fluorine um, because fluorinated compounds are pretty popular, but uh, really there's only um, four or five or six, depending on whether or not you count the hydrogen in your representation or not. And that changes the way that people think about these models. It is okay to learn why nitrogen is different from carbon simply through brute force of showing in enough situations where nitrogen is different from carbon. In the inorganic material spaces I'll talk about, um, there's many different elements. And so that changes the way that you have to think about the problem a little bit. Another thing to keep in mind is that in the small molecule space, the computational chemistry methods are really well developed. Um, there's a small number of atoms. There's also a small number of electrons. And so that means you can use very accurate uh, computational chemistry methods, and they don't take a huge amount of time. We can run DFT on a molecule like this, and it might take order um, minutes. Um, type binding might be order seconds. If I um, think about really complicated methods like coupled cluster, um, that might be hours or days. Um, there are people who do really um, uh, top level calculations like um, quantum Monte Carlo, where you, you basically get the exact answer. Um, and it is possible to basically go to that level and say, what is, what is the exact answer? Um, so there are a lot of really large data sets that have taken advantage of this, um, this scalability and this relatively fast compute. 
And that means that the data sets here are very large. Um, they're, they've been around for a while. People have been doing high throughput calculations for small molecules for a long time. There's many different self-consistent databases available. Most of them are more than 100,000 molecules. There's already some that are more than 100 million, which is just wild. Um, if you think about 100 million DFT calculations. Um, at the same time, uh, there are some things that make this problem really hard. And um, specifically, it's the fact that people really care about entropy and fluctuations. Um, and so those two things are sort of difficult to capture with um, simple DFT calculations. And the other problem is that um, for a lot of biological systems, because things are so, so, so targeted in this area, very small energy differences are important. So maybe on the order of one kcal per mole. This is much more stringent than in a lot of inorganic materials. So um, there's a lot of data and the methods are good, but at the same time, you also have to be really accurate for people to trust your results. And the obvious application areas for these small molecules, the ones that are driving most of the materials discovery efforts are things like biopharma, um, polymer uh, design and synthesis, and organic photovoltaics. Um, that's where you see most of the databases. So let's go through a couple of these uh, properties quickly. So I mentioned that um, a group had already brute forced the number of uh, small molecules. Um, and this data set is freely available. It's called the GDB17 data set. It doesn't have energies or forces from DFT. It is just an enumeration. Um, this was in 2013. It contains a lot of other data sets basically inside of it because a lot of them were just subsamples. And a lot of the data sets that you see are basically people taking things from GDB17, subsampling them, and then running DFT calculations. So for example, um, the QM7 data set is uh, the GDB17 data set after you select only things that have less than seven heavy atoms. The QM9 data set is much larger, um, but it's the same idea. Um, just you select everything up to nine heavy atoms instead of seven. And there's a whole host of small molecule data sets that are all based on this original GDB17 one. It's nice that someone already did the hard work to say what is available. Um, it also means that afterwards you can go back and say, of all of the small molecules that we know of up to 17, what is the one that is best for my application? That is something that's really hard in other areas where you can't enumerate absolutely every possibility. Okay, the second thing that I mentioned is that really small energy differences are important here. So as an example, um, I wanna think about a, um, a simple uh, C4 molecule. So this is two methyl groups um, on uh, two um, CH2 groups linked together. And if you look at this, um, you can see that there's actually a, um, a rotation that's possible. I'm gonna swing either the, the right or the left functional group around. And um, depending on how I do that, um, I'm gonna get different energies. There's gonna be different local minima, and there's also gonna be a barrier for going over that. So the one on the left is different from the one on the right because the CH3 groups are tilted by 60 degrees. If you look at the energy profile of um, this rotation, we can see that there are three different energy minima. Um, it's rotationally symmetric, so it goes from zero to 180 and back. Um, the other thing that we see is that um, the difference between local minima is very small, um, noticeable but small. So if I have the CH3 groups apart or across from each other um, versus right next to each other, there's a difference of about four kcal per mole um, or four kilojoules per mole. So this is a relatively small energy difference. And if we wanna be able to capture this, we need a method that is at the four kilojoule per mole level. Um, these confirmations are really, really complicated to capture. And there's a lot of these degrees of freedom. This is a very simple case. Um, and a lot of these larger molecules, there's many, many different bonds that you can rotate around and get different distinct local minima. So that makes this problem really hard. Okay, so that's small molecules. Um, the next thing I wanna talk about is the work that's been done on the material science side, really driven by efforts like the Materials Genome Project. So um, these materials are, um, uh, come from a very large set of possible spaces. There are databases of possible um, experimental data sets already available. Um, the computational data sets have gotten much more popular recently. Uh, there's a lot of um, sort of order one to five million enumerated structures out there. Um, but this is really just a very small subset of possibilities. Um, no one can go and generate every possible crystal structure with every possible elemental composition because it's just too large and it's just a combinatorially large space. So um, there is no amount of work that we're gonna do 
to make something like the GDB-17 for all possible crystal structures. What we can do is look at one of these large databases and select from there, and that's usually a good starting point, but that makes things difficult. The real challenge with inorganic materials is that the number of elements goes up from five or six to pretty much the entire periodic table. And so one of the things I wanna really drive home as we talk about these different representations is that some representations scale well with the number of elements and some scale very poorly. If it scares, scales poorly, then it's okay to apply to small molecules or specific subsets of composition space. But as soon as you have to try materials across the entire periodic table, you run into challenges and that changes how you think about the problem. The computational methods are fairly well established. Most of these crystal structures are pretty small, so that's good. Um, DFT works fairly well for most of these. Uh, there are well-known issues when you go to things like large crystal structures or you wanna incorporate disorder or entropy um, or with some very specific classes of materials like oxides where DFT does not do a good job of describing the behavior. But for most of these crystal structures, the, the methods are fairly well established. Um, the data sets are, are getting pretty good. There's already several large computational databases at the order 100,000 to maybe small number of million size. So that's excellent. Um, you can get really powerful models of that size. Um, and I would say the, the key challenges here are um, one, there's a lot of properties that we wanna consider. And so um, in addition to the normal things like stability, we also want to capture things like mechanical properties, which are sort of more complicated calculations or thermal or electronic properties. Um, that can be a little bit tricky and require different levels of theory. Um, periodic boundary conditions are also really important and I'm gonna talk about why that's an issue. Um, it's a little bit silly, but it is a way to distinguish um, what's being done in this community from what's being done with small molecules and that often limits the representation that we use. The accuracy is a little less stringent than small molecules. Typically we're happy with something on the order of 50 milliEV per atom accuracy. Um, so that's a little bit better than um, with a small molecule case. Um, and the driving applications, the reason why people are pushing these efforts are really um, energy materials, photovoltaics, thermoelectric batteries. Um, most of the big screening efforts are in those spaces. So I wanna start with periodic boundary conditions um, for those who aren't super familiar. Um, most people see these sort of arguments when um, if you've ever taken a course on molecular simulations and you're trying to write a small MD code, this comes up right away. Um, the idea is basically we wanna represent an infinite system. So a really large nanoparticle or a really large extended bulk material. And we want a very small calculation to do. So we repeat that thing over and over. This is an assumption that we make. It is not always a great assumption. Um, you need to make sure the, the unit cell is large enough to capture the complexity. Um, but this is really the basis of most of the calculations in, in organic materials. The idea is basically every atom can see an image of every other atom being repeated around. And usually um, we just think about one unit cell to the right or left or up or down. So for example, in this picture on the left, um, this central red atom sees three blue and one red. And that red atom that it sees is actually an image of the red atom inside of its own cell, just repeated over one cell. The cutoff radius in this case, um, if it is less than half of this unit cell width, the atom cannot see itself. But if this gets large enough, it is possible for it to see itself and that becomes an issue. Um, that's something that we have to think about and we have to make sure that our representation captures. Most of the cutoff radii that I'll talk about today are order four to 10 angstroms, usually between four to six. So usually this is fairly local and usually the unit cells are a little bit larger than that. Um, the reason I bring this up is because um, it's really easy to describe these periodic boundary conditions. It's easy to think about it. When you run your DFT calculation, um, it will take care of all this stuff for you. But it is also really, really easy to make mistakes and it's easy for this operation to be slow. And I would say um, my own research group and experimental collaborator or theoretical collaborators in related areas, um, we spend an embarrassing amount of time worrying about our PPC implementations um, even though it is relatively simple. So if you um, are taking a small molecule code and applying it to materials, this is something you're gonna have to worry about. It's probably the first thing that you're gonna have to deal with. Another thing that comes up is the modeling question of what do you do after you apply your periodic boundary conditions? So um, 
on the left here, I've shown a really simple crystal structure. Um, let's say all the atoms are exactly the same. But inside of the unit cell, there is one central red atom. And then there is a, another blue atom in the unit cell that is being repeated around. So there's basically two different um, atoms in this representation. This is like if you went to the materials project and said, give me the cubic cell representation, it would give you something that has two atoms, even though they're all the same atom. And if I draw a little cutoff radius of four angstrom that's larger than the, the bond radius of about three and a half, what I see is that this red atom um, is, uh, could be considered a neighbor for all four of these blue atoms. Okay, if I just make arguments on how is it covalently bound, I would say um, there are four bonds for that red atom probably. There's a modeling question then or a representation question on what do I do with this bonding information? So I could say, um, I could reduce this down and I could say every atom is bonded with itself four times in different representations if it is the same red atom being repeated over and over again. A common assumption in some of these graph representations that I'll talk about is that you just pick the minimum image convention um, nearest neighbor. So for each atom type, I look at the nearest image of the second type of atom. Um, I choose the one that is closest and that's the one that I put into the representation. So for the same system, I would label this as a red atom is labeled with, is uh, bound to itself. If I don't reduce for symmetry, now there's two types of atoms, even though they are essentially the same under symmetry. And in that case, I have sort of the same question. I could call this every red, red atom is bonded with four blue atoms and vice versa, right? If I look at a blue atom, I can say there's four red atoms around. And I could also say that um, if I just look at the nearest image convention, um, every red atom is bound to a blue atom. So um, my suggestion when you move forward with these things is to um, really think about what happens under periodic bonding conditions. Um, all things considered, I would, uh, um, I would suggest trying to include the one that has all of the bonds present. So that's the one that um, wouldn't change after you repeat it under periodic bonding conditions. Um, but this issue comes up a lot. And when you read papers on graph convolution methods that I'll talk about, um, this is a common modeling question that uh, partially explains why some models work better or worse than others. And this is worth keeping in mind. Um, again, it's very simple, um, but it is a real logistical challenge when dealing with these representations. Okay, for inorganic materials, there are a couple of large data sets. Um, I chose just two based on ones that I am particularly familiar with. Um, the first is AFLOLib run out of Duke University, and the second is the Materials Project um, run out of LBL and uh, Berkeley by Christine Kirsten and others. Um, both of them, I would say, apply sort of the same way of thinking about things. Calculations are fairly similar. Um, AFLOLib tends to have more enumerations of the same types of structures. Materials Project usually has, um, is a little more driven by what might be experimentally relevant, but both are very similar ways of thinking about things. Um, I highlighted the Materials Project just because when you read data sets on uh, representations in material science, most of them use the materials project data set um, as a benchmark. So that's the one that people have chosen to use, not for any particular scientific reason, just because um, it's easy to download from and people are familiar with it. Okay, and finally, I wanna talk about um, why surface science and catalysis, which is really where um, I spend most of my time in my research group, um, is, is so complicated and why this has been really challenging for me to think about these representations. So uh, the possible space of materials or configurations that I need to think about uh, is really overwhelming. And so the problem is I basically take all of the diversity of small molecules that I just talked about. There's 160 billion small organic molecules that I can put on a surface. Um, I combine that with all of the possible diversity of all of the inorganic materials that I could choose as a catalyst. And I add to that the fact that every one of these crystals can be cut in different orientations. So there's different possible surfaces and determinations that can be exposed. And so if I wanna really solve a catalysis problem, especially for one of these complicated systems, I need to think about all the materials, all the surfaces, all the ways that I can put a small molecule on the surface and all the different configurations of that molecule. So um, this is all of the hard things about small molecules combined with all of the hard things about energetic materials 
which has made it really, really hard to make um, substantial progress in this area. Um, the number of elements is same as inorganic materials. In catalysis, we consider everything. Um, the accuracy of the computational methods are also a limitation. So for example, um, when you start to consider an extended periodic system for a surface, usually the number of atoms goes up. It's common to do 20 to 100 atoms, which is a little larger than in inorganic materials usually is. Um, that makes DFT reasonable, but a little slow. And there's not that many experimental benchmark methods or data sets. Um, Charlie Campbell at University of Washington is really um, the leader in those efforts. Um, because there's so few numbers that we really 100% absolutely know, there's a lot of different competing methods. So um, you'll read papers in this area and um, people will use PBE or RPBE or B van der Waals or hybrid methods or RPA. Um, and it is really hard to say exactly what is the right answer besides um, as you go up the chain to hybrid and RPA, it probably gets more accurate. Disorder and um, uh, large nanoparticles are both common things we want to think about in catalysis. Um, we often consider oxides, so all the problems with oxides I mentioned for materials also show up here. The data sets are really small compared to materials and small molecules, but they're growing. Um, all the ones that I'm aware of are less than 100,000 structures, and most of those have been published in the past year or two or so. Um, so we have all of the diversity of the first two, but our data sets are orders of magnitude smaller, which is a problem. Um, common challenges, uh, there's a lot of reactions we need to consider. Um, the accuracy is not super stringent, usually plus or minus 0 0.1 EV is okay. Um, and like I said, um, the things that are driving um, are energy materials, um, but on top of that, there's applications to manufacturing fuel cells and batteries. So let's go into a little more detail. Um, so for one of these surfaces, um, I'm thinking about all of the possible intermediates that I could have in a possible reaction pathway. So this is a paper that I worked on when I was a postdoc a few years ago. We're looking at a relatively simple system of CO and hydrogen in the gas phase reacting to selectively make one of a number of um, possible products, which could be ethanol, methane, acetaldehyde, methanol, water, CO2. Um, ideally, we want to make something valuable like acetaldehyde or methanol, and we don't want to burn into CO2 and water. Even for the simple rhodium system, this is one metal, flat surface, no complexity. There are thousands of possible pathways that I could write down. And finding just the reduced pathway on the right means I have to consider all the possible intermediates and all the possible reactions. So that gets really, really time consuming. For any individual intermediate, I have to do a series of calculations where I watch these adsorbates move around and find the most stable configuration. So this is an example of an OH on a nickel gallium site from some unpublished work. Um, I guessed it should be on a, um, a nickel green and it looks like it sort of moves over to a nickel gallium bridge. Um, this is actually sort of moving sites and it's changing configuration. So it's very dynamic. It's hard to choose the right representation here. And in order to get this right, I don't just have to do this calculation. Um, this is a local optimization. I have to move the OH around in a lot of different places and find the lowest configuration. So that's very complicated. Um, this is also fairly expensive. And so this is NERSC. So we have to talk about everything in terms of service units. So for this small molecule sitting on a extended surface, um, we're talking somewhere between one and 20,000 service units, which is pretty expensive as far as these things go. Okay, um, the same idea of small molecules on inorganic materials comes up over and over. It's not just uh, thermal catalysis, it's also CO2 utilization, water splitting, um, hydrogen storage, um, selective catalysis, water desalination and remediation, um, polymer metal interfaces, um, corrosion resistance. All of these are basically the same fundamental question of how do small molecules interact with inorganic surfaces? And again, um, it's the same hard problem that shows up everywhere. Okay, so with those ideas in mind, we can start to think about how might we compare different types of representations for the system that we care about. So I wanna start with small molecules because again, that's the most established and there's been a lot of work in that area. Um, on the left is um, a picture of some work um, on developing machine learning models for how two different um, molecules might be similar to each other using the QM9 data set. This was the first paper to um, really say what QM9 was. They were the ones who did those calculations. Um, that's only 2012, only eight years ago. 
On the right is sort of a review high level benchmark paper called Molecule Net by Vijay Panda at Stanford. And um, what they did was they compared a lot of different methods. And this is a very um, similar thing that you would see in any other area of machine learning. We're interested in how does the accuracy change as a function of the training set size? So this is a simple learning curve. This comes up over and over. Um, that's great. Um, all things considered, I want to be as low as possible. So deep tensor neural networks and kernel rage seem to be doing really well. Cool. What is fascinating about this area to me is that you can analyze these trends. And on a log scale, there's a lot of very interesting properties. So I'm going to take exactly the same learning curve. And I am going to replot it on a log log scale. Um, on the x-axis, it'll be log of the training set size. On the y-axis, it'll be log of the MAE. And um, what we see is that a lot of these methods, um, and I'll show you ones for a lot of different things for QM9 in a second, um, a lot of these methods are very linear, um, so surprisingly linear in this log space. The slope of the method says something about what is the effective dimensionality. So we want this thing to be as low as possible, so shift the whole thing down. We also want it to be as steep as possible, which means adding more data makes it grow. And we can often get some insight into what's going on with these systems by looking for features like um, a plateau in this space usually implies that there's multiple data points that all have the same representation. So that's something that we can see. This sort of analysis assumes that you have a uniformly sampled data set. And um, if you have biased data, you're going to get different curves. So this isn't the, something, the sort of thing that you can just do for the model. This is really the model. And the, but it does give us some idea of um, not just is one model more accurate than another at 100,000 data points, but how is it scaling? And is the representation actually more powerful or not? So I'm going to take the same idea, and I'm going to apply it to a lot of small molecules, um, a lot of different uh, small molecule models. And Anatoly von Lillenfeld at um, uh, University of Basel, um, now at the University of Vienna, has really driven a lot of this. He has an awesome presentation on these sort of ideas for small molecules with the link at the bottom. Um, this paper is, this chart is from um, his slides, and he has a couple of related papers. Um, and what we see is that there's a ton of different methods that people have proposed for small molecules, all with different representations. Um, you can shift up and down, and there's also different slopes. So um, qualitatively, right away, we can see that there's already two different classes of methods. Um, one is these ones in the upper right, things like bag of bonds, which I'll talk about. They have a lower slope than a lot of these other methods that are newer and a little more complicated and include more properties in the feature set. Um, so qualitatively, the fact that those two slopes are different says that the red one is, um, the, the lower red one is um, probably more powerful because it's scaling better. We can shift that whole line up or down by playing around with how we train or how we do the hyperparameter optimization. But it's pretty rare that you actually change the slope by playing around with the parameters. The second thing that's fascinating to me about this is that these lines are remarkably linear. So um, I wouldn't have expected, without having seen this sort of work, that things would continue to decrease at the same log rate as you increase the data set size. This is very powerful because what it says is that um, you can do small data set training. I can do 100, and I can do 500 and 1,000 all of which train fast and all of which I can train on a Google Colab instance or my own laptop or a desktop or something like that. And the scaling of that says something about how accurate you might be at 100,000. That is really powerful, right? That says that you don't need to be doing these really crazy trainings in order to develop better methods. So that's really cool and um, not something that's obvious in all machine learning areas. It seems to be something about um, these large, diverse, well-sampled, unbiased data sets. OK. Um, we can do the same thing, not just for small molecules. We can also do it for inorganic crystals. So um, this, is a, um, uh, this is a chart that I made for some unpublished collaborative work. Um, on the left are small molecules, basically the same as before, QM9 with two different types of models, same models that I was showing here. On the right, is the materials project energy formation data set with two common methods that I'll talk about called CGCNN and SHNET. And um, what's interesting is that the same method, SHNET, 
applied to two different data sets or two different regimes yields two different slopes. And so this also says something about what is the effective dimensionality of this problem. On the left, with this QM9 data set, um, the slope is minus 0.57. It is about um, twice or half the dimensionality of the materials project data set. And I think a lot of that is coming from the elemental diversity. So this sort of analysis not only helps you compare different types of representations, it also helps you get an idea of just how hard is your problem compared to these other areas and how big of a data set are you going to need in order to really solve the challenges that you're talking about. Um, so this is something that I've been really excited about um, this year. Okay, with that in mind, um, I'll start jumping into representations. Um, Zach, I think before I do that, yeah, oh, there's a question for some time. Yeah, very some sorry, to, sorry to interrupt. There, there was one question on those uh, plots that you just showed. Um, do you want me to read it or, or do you want to read it yourself? I can see it. Um, so the question is, um, what does the y-axis mean here, the total energy or thermochemistry data? Let me uh, go back. Um, I think you're talking about this one. Is that right? Yeah, that was it. Cool. Okay. Um, so the y-axis here is, I believe, the formation energy or the atomization energy of these small molecules. And that is basically the energy. Um, the atomization energy is um, I take a small molecule and I calculate the energy. And then I keep on dilating it, making it bigger and bigger and bigger until all the atoms are really spread out and don't see each other. And that is sort of the same thing as a cohesive energy in small molecules. So those are the two metrics that people usually use with these QM9 data sets. You could just as easily do the same thing for any other property like polarizability or um, uh, maybe how much it likes some solvent or some electronic property like the band gap or the homo lumo gap or whatever else you want. Um, those are all common, but the formation energy is the one that people tend to use when developing these new methods. If anyone else has a question on the representations or the challenges, I'm happy to take a second and answer it now. It can usually take folks a moment to, to write their questions, but you can always yeah, of course. answer them later too. I'll give a minute. It's already been about uh, half an hour. Okay, um, so I'll go ahead and continue, but if I see anything pop up, um, I'm happy to take some time and and chat and discuss a little more. Okay. So um, let's start thinking about different types of ways that we can represent these, these materials. So the first one that I want to start with is the simplest, and that is a composition feature where we're just looking at the types and um, number of the different elements. So this is especially common in material science. Um, usually experimentally, if you're making something, you might only know this um, how much of each material went into it. You might not know exactly what the crystal structure is or other things that we care about um, for some of the more complicated models. And so um, the general idea is that you take the composition on the left, so maybe some binary oxide or some other ternary um, inorganic material, and you want to enumerate a lot of features of each one of these element types. So I might have a set of features for silicon and yttrium and fluorine and oxygen and whatever else I care about. There's often a feature combination step to mix those things together. Like maybe I will um, find the average atomic um, mass by weighting the mole fraction of each one by the atomic mass of each element. And then those final feature combinations go into something like um, either standard supervised regression or some other um, standard ML technique. Um, after the feature combination stage, we have a fixed length vector that we can play around with. Uh, the pros of this are, it's very simple, it's physically motivated, I only need to know the composition. Um, it's also very simple and um, uh, because it's so simple, it often works with very small data sets, so that's cool. Um, the cons is that obviously this composition doesn't allow me to specify why um, one polymorph of this binary oxide might be different from another polymorph with the same stoichiometry. So it can't handle polymorphs, it won't um, tell me why certain structural features are important. And if you apply this to a very large data set, like the materials project formation energies, it tends to perform quite a bit worse than the more complicated representations we're going to talk about later. 
there are a couple of libraries that people use in this space over and over. So um, the most common one is the set of descriptors called the Magpie Descriptors from Chris Wilberton's group at Northwestern University, um, published in 2014. Um, Bryce Meredig um, was one of the students on that paper. Um, Bryce is also the CTO of Citroen Informatics, which does a lot of work um, with similar problems in material science now. Basically, they went through and collected a bunch of different properties um, and some standard combinations. So some combinations of um, uh, the types of elements and their fractions, um, elemental properties like the mean, absolute deviation, um, minimum, maximum mode, whatever for things like the atomic number or the radii or um, number of electrons or a bunch of other common ones. They have electronic structure attributes and they have ionic, contramet, ionic compound attributes. Not all of these are important for every application, but this is pretty comprehensive. And the hope is that something in these magpie descriptors might actually be useful for the actual, um, for your actual problem at hand. And so the goal of the machine learning method is to then say, which of those features is particularly important. There's a lot of implementations now because they're very common. Um, uh, there's a set of code for Magpie itself. Um, Johannes Hockman has done the same thing at the University of Buffalo. Um, Anubhav Jain at LBL has a bunch of these implemented in Automat Miner, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but I would say a lot of things really rest on these, um, the same set of descriptors at this point. You can take these descriptors and you can find linear or nonlinear combinations that might make even better descriptors. And so this is very common in the material space. Um, uh, Matthias Schreffler and um, others have really been driving this, Luca Gerangeli. Um, basically, you search for some nonlinear combination of these that describes the property that you're interested in. And so um, in this example, they basically found that with these two really complicated descriptors, they were able to really well separate what was a metal or a non-metal. And um, this is cool because you can see the algebraic formulation. Um, I have some idea of which properties are important. And it does quite a nice job um, of actually distinguishing those two. And so when you deal with these composition features, one of the really common things that you do to improve the representation is run it through a code like CISO, which tries to find the best nonlinear combination to help you with your, with your problem. Um, this, is, this is really common, so that's why I bring it up. The next type of representation I want to talk about um, is fragments, which are really common in the small molecule space and less common in inorganic materials. Uh, the idea is super old. Um, we can look back to um, even the 50s. Um, the classical um, paper is um, by Benson when he was at uh, USC. And it's um, typically referred to as Benson group additivity. And the idea is basically that I am going to represent the energy um, of this, maybe the formation energy or something else, of this small molecule by adding up all the contributions from different subsets. This is motivated by looking at something like an alkene chain. So on the left bottom, um, this is formation energies, heats of formation for alkenes of different lengths. And what we see is that as we add more and more CH2 groups to the middle of this, the extra heat of formation always increases by about 4.9. So what this tells me is that the intrinsic formation energy of a CH2 group in an alkane chain is probably 4.9. The way that I apply this to a larger molecule is that I go through and find all of the uh, unique types. So there is one methyl group with a carbon, so that's labeled one, um, or there's two of those, one on each side. Um, there is one carbon that has two methyl groups and another carbon nearby. And I'm going to represent the total energy as a linear combination of each of those independent fragments. Um, this idea works really well. It's super common in thermochemistry. Um, it's been around forever. Um, fragments are basically based on this idea and this argument. The more modern analogy of this for small molecules is something called um, Morgan fingerprints or extended circular fingerprints, abbreviated as ECFP. And the idea is basically the same. I'm gonna take the small molecule and I'm just going to break it up into little bits, either based on um, just 
radius zero, which is just the number of elements, or radius one, which is the uh, central atom and something nearby. Um, if I increase the size of the radius, um, I will get larger and larger fragments. So um, each of these is now a fundamental thing that I'm going to build my model off of. I could build a linear model. I could also build a nonlinear model. And one common um, way to take all of these different fragments and turn it into representation is shown on the bottom left. Um, you basically take every fragment, you do a hash, and you hash it to a certain point in a fixed length vector so that multiple um, fragments might share the same hash, but the, if it's long enough, the likelihood of that is small. And then this fixed length vector, this binary vector, becomes a reasonable representation for the overall molecule. This is then something that you can feed into a machine learning method to try and predict some final property. Identical idea, just instead of it being a linear model in terms of the fragments, um, it could be nonlinear. And also, instead of just being um, radius one, you can do larger fragments. This is good, and that is simple and physical. The downside of this approach is that it scales very poorly with the number of elements or number of fragments. So every fragment is considered different here. There's no intrinsic idea of why um, some of these alkene-like fragments are similar to one another. They're all considered completely independent. And so there's no way of combining those things together. If you see a new fragment that you've um, never seen before in a, in a hypothetical molecule, you're sort of stuck, and that makes it challenging. A related idea, I would say also in the same fragment approach, is something called the bag of bonds method, where instead of focusing on the elements or the atoms, instead I focus on the bonds or the type of bonds. And so uh, basically what you're going to do is you're going to go through and you're going to collect all of the radii, all the bond distances for every type of bond. So that could be an oxygen oxygen bond or a CO bond or a CC bond or whatever else you want. And I'm going to take all those radii and I am going to stack them all together um, into their respective groups. And that is going to become a fixed length representation um, of my molecule. Again, um, very simple idea. The, the idea is just that um, there are some intrinsic properties of certain bonds that can influence molecule reactivity. There's also a correlation between this representation and which molecule you're talking about. Fundamentally, um, very similar. If you see a new bond type that you haven't seen before, you're going to have trouble. Okay. These approaches work really well in small molecules. And if you want to try out these things, my suggestion is to use a tool like RDKit, which is open source, really helpful. Um, we'll uh, do all sorts of different um, simple fragment-based fingerprinting methods. Um, I wouldn't write this sort of thing from scratch. There's already really, really good methods for doing this. Um, okay, let's take a second before moving on. I see another question. Um, on slide 20, um, there was MAE versus training data set size, and you talked about good ML and bad ML. Um, okay, um, so let's take a step back and then I'll come back to this one. So that's 29, okay. So let's go back to the uh, good ML and bad ML. Okay. The problem in this case, the reason why it's saturating, is that um, if you have two molecules that have the same representation, and one has, for example, an energy formation of five kilojoules per mole, and the other has a uh, formation energy of 200 kilojoules per mole, but they have exactly the same representation, no matter how good your machine learning model is, neural network, Gaussian process, um, kernel method, it, whatever you want, it doesn't matter. Um, it cannot distinguish between those two. It has exactly the same representation, but it's labeled in two different ways. So the best that you can do is you can guess halfway in between and um, you're bad at both. That is usually one of the driving drivers for this sort of saturation behavior. Um, and it's basically an idea that your model is not complicated enough to distinguish between different things that have different properties. The same thing comes up, and I think this is a good question, the same thing comes up with um, composition descriptors. For example, um, I could have a lot of compositions that have very, very different energies, and 
from a representation like this, I would have no way of distinguishing them. The model would have to label all of them the same energy. And if I'm trying to label a bunch of polymorphs and they all have different energy but the same composition, I'm stuck right away. Um, my, my model is not gonna get any better after I add some more data um, because I cannot distinguish between the things that I've already seen. Um, this comes up a lot. It's a good way of diagnosing either issues with the data set or issues with the representation. The same problem can come up if you have bad data where um, you have two of the same molecule and they're labeled differently. Um, you get a very similar sort of behavior. Okay, cool. So moving on a little bit, um, another very common representation in small molecules is a grammar or text-based approach based on the idea that um, there are already languages for how to describe a small molecule. So I can talk about something like um, the smiles of a molecule. Um, depending on who you ask, I would say that it's easy to read or not. Um, basically, you go through that string and it says, <coughs> um, how are these atoms bonded together? Implicitly, there's a bunch of hydrogens around. You can say there are functional groups. If there's a double bond, it's an equal sign. If it's a single bond, there's nothing. Um, this is an established language that the organic chemists are already using to describe one molecule versus another. It is very powerful because there's already a lot of really good machine learning models that operate on text strings. And so people have um, spent a lot of time applying natural language processing tools to these sort of SMILES representations. One downside to SMILES is that if you generate a SMILES string, um, there could be multiple SMILES that all correspond to the same thing. So it's not necessarily unique. So that makes things a little complicated. A second problem is that um, if I just generate some random string of numbers and letters, so um, CHC, OOOO, um, CC, whatever, um, it's possible to generate a string that does not decode to a real molecule. And so that means that if your natural language processing tool is just spitting out um, strings, some of those might not even be molecules. It's just making up nonsense. A lot of the progress in small molecules has been driven by better representations or by um, basically improving the actual grammar of the string itself. So um, this selfies representation by Alana Spurogusik's group um, is another string-based representation that basically um, enforces, it has some nice properties such that um, it always decodes to a small molecule. So no matter what string you generate, you can decode that thing and it will be um, something interesting. So that's very cool. That means that I can apply all the super cool stuff going on in um, machine learning, like um, BERT or other um, NLP models, and I can apply those directly to this area. I can also apply generative text models to small molecules. That's cool. The problem is there's no such thing for inorganic materials or things like catalysis. So this is super cool for small molecules, but it doesn't scale. One of the cool things that you can do because of these sort of representations is you can come up with um, uh, variational autoencoders or other generative models or GANs, and you can generate new small molecules um, that are basically hypothetical things that you should try and test. This has gotten very hot in the past couple of years. It's really interesting. Um, a lot of it, again, is driven by the fact that it's very easy to do these things because people have already done it for um, text and other applications. It's hard to apply the same idea to materials. The next type of representation I want to talk about is a little bit more complicated. Everything up until now, I haven't really talked about bonds or um, angles or, or other complicated features. And there is a whole host of methods that try and look at a atom and its nearby neighbors and try and come up with a representation that describes what's going on locally. So one of the most common um, is something called a high dimensional neural network potential or a atom centered symmetry function or a baylor Perinello machine learning potential. All of those are the same thing. The idea is basically um, you take the, each atom you look at its neighbors, you try and come up with a fixed length representation, 
you take that representation and maybe you use it to compare it to another structure or you apply that to some machine learning model and um, you try and predict the energy and sum those things up. There's some small differences in how that gets done, but the same idea um, comes up over and over. These Baylor Paranello or HDNMP potentials have been around since 2007. So um, the idea of doing machine learning potentials is already almost 15 years old. To come up with this fixed length representation, what you normally do is um, for every entry in this fixed length vector, I'm gonna use it to describe a certain type of interaction. So for example, one of these entries in this vector might be um, all of the copper-copper bonds. I am gonna take all of the radii for those bonds. I will use it in this little lookup table with some um, eta specified. So let's say eta is um, four and um, the radius is three. I'm gonna look up that value and it's about a G2 of 0 0.15 or so. And I will do that for every such copper copper bond, add them all together in my local radius cutoff environment, and take the sum, put it in the vector. I can do the same thing for angles. Uh, this has to be done for every unique combination. So I'm gonna take all of the copper carbon copper angles and apply the same um, lookup table idea to the theta that I get out of that angle computation. And I'm gonna add up all of those that happen nearby me. And I'm gonna shove all those into another section of the vector. This idea is very cool um, in that it, um, these features look a lot like the sort of features that would go into a classical machine or classical potential. But one major downside of this approach is that um, if you have to do this for every unique combination of elements, so copper, 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 carbon, copper, oxygen, whatever, um, the length of the vector can become cubic scaling in the number of elements. And that makes it really difficult to apply to things like um, inorganic materials across the entire periodic table. So these local environment fingerprints are really, really powerful and really common in either small molecules or in inorganic materials where you have a small number of elements. Right. Um, this is sort of getting back to why certain fields have different representations and what makes things hard. A second thing is that um, this implicitly assumes that the representation should be local. So um, if there are long range interactions, it can be hard to capture those in this sort, of, um, this sort of model. And that's another active research area that I'll talk about. There are many, many, many such local environment fingerprints. So um, there's reviews coming out all the time. This is one from Gotiker uh, just this year. They compared um, many body symmetry functions, this FCHL um, representation from Anatoly's group, um, SOAP descriptors, um, orbital matrix, um, ACSF, which is the one I showed in the previous one. Um, all of these are very similar in terms of the idea, um, but are different ways of representing things or have different symmetry properties. Um, I would say maybe the second most common of all of these is probably the set of SOAP descriptors, which is short for smooth overlap of atomic positions. Lots and lots of different representations. Um, this is another choice you have to make. For every single one of these, there's another choice of what should all of these magical numbers be and um, how many different types of things should you include. So um, the problem gets a little bit overwhelming. People have already started to compare accuracy for these different methods. <laughs> so this is a really nice paper from uh, uh, Shui Ping Ong's group at UCSD, where they basically went through and for a, um, a very common material science problem, compared different types of descriptors and different types of potentials, both in terms of the computational cost and the error. And um, one interesting thing that came out of this was that um, these moment tensor potentials, which are relatively new, seemed to do quite well. They were either more accurate or lower computational cost, depending on what you care about on the upper right graph. Um, the other cool thing is that um, you can see how all of these different methods have different accuracies for these sort of situations. Um, this neural network potential is the same as the ACSF I was showing before, so those orange points are also pretty good. Um, before you get started in one of these areas, I would think about what is easy to implement, and I would also think about um, what is the benchmark data set that is closest to what you're doing 
so that you don't have to try each one of these for your system and see which one is most accurate. As I said, one of the downsides to this sort of local approach is that you don't get long range forces. So the most common long range force is electrostatic interactions. That is, if I have charge on my molecule, um, a charged atom interacting with another charged atom will scale as um, one over R um, squared, which is really scary. That's a very, very long range force. So if you only look at your nearest neighbors, you can't get that sort of energy. And right away, you're gonna be limited. This is gonna to lead to the same unique representation problems that people were asking about before. So this is a, um, a relatively hot area now, um, trying to add in electrostatics and long range forces. This is a paper that came out just um, a month or two ago by Baylor. Um, basically, they implement two different neural networks with very similar symmetry functions, very similar representations. And they have a first step where they try and um, predict the electronegativity, then they solve for the equilibrium charge. They take those charges and put them into an electrostatic, uh, electrostatic model. They take the same charges and use them as features in the neural network potentials. And the total energy now has an electrostatic component that can be quite long range. Um, this is uh, very new. It is um, uh, models like this are helping to push these models into more complicated areas like electrochemical systems where things are definitely, definitely charged because we're putting a potential across the system. Similar ideas have been done for small molecules. So for example, um, this was uh, work by Michele Seriotti last year, basically looking at other ways of including long range effects into these sort of interactions. Um, uh, the point I just wanna get across is that um, if you know that you have long range forces, you need to be aware of it. Um, and it's gonna change the way that you represent your system. So if you have a charge system and you just take a, a, local, um, a local method and you just assume it's gonna work because of machine learning, you're probably gonna have a bad time. The last thing I wanna talk about with these local features is that some people have thought about how to improve the element scaling. So there is a, um, a representation called the weighted atom centered symmetry function where you basically add an additional weight on these symmetry functions that depends on the atomic number. Um, that allows you to have a fixed length representation and scale. Um, the performance on that for integrating materials hasn't been awesome, but it does partially solve the element scaling problem. Another example is by um, John Kitchen in my department here at CMU. Um, he basically showed that the same set of uh, weights um, in the same network could actually be used for all of the different elements, as long as you made the final energies the nearly dependent on the final layer. You still have a problem of FP1 and FP2 and FP3 are scaling quadratically with the number of elements, but it reduces it by at least one, um, one factor. Ideas like this might help partially address some of the, some of the issues with these methods and open up um, how applicable they are in other areas. Okay. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that it has gotten really easy to make a neural network potential. And so um, these are just the, the ones that I know of off the top of my head. Um, and I included links for all of them if you're interested, um, just alphabetical order. Um, don't rewrite your own neural network potential from scratch unless you're really sure that something is new. Um, this area is moving really quickly. Um, you might as well share code. Um, there's been a proliferation of methods and it's getting a little bit crazy in this area. Okay, um, moving on to something a little bit more complicated and a little bit closer to what Tess was talking about last month. Um, graph methods got really popular in about 2015 with this paper by Ryan Adams and Alan Asperger-Guzik when he was at Harvard. Um, the idea is basically to apply graph convolution networks to small molecules. We usually assume for small molecules that there's a one hot encoding. So this is um, this was started from this paper. I am going to choose a representation for every one of these atoms um, as a binary one hot. Um, if it's a hydrogen, the representation is zero, one, zero, zero. If it's an oxygen, it's zero, zero, one, zero. There is a whole host of methods that are all related, um, slightly different methods, but um, same fundamental idea, same sort of inputs. Um, the same molecule net paper that I talked about earlier from Vijay Panda's group 
does a really nice job of talking about how they're different or how they're similar. Um, if you're interested, I would definitely read those first. Um, most of them are based on the idea that uh, you're looking locally and um, applying convolution operations, or you're um, passing messages around and then trying to collect the messages and predict final properties. So there's a modeling question now um, on the representation side of how do you take a molecular structure and make it a graph? Um, this is something that um, is not obvious all the time. So the nodes are pretty obvious. Usually those are atomic nuclei, but it could also be a coarse green subunit, like a whole methyl group could be a node. Edges are usually either bonds or every atom within a radius or cutoff. And I'll talk a little bit about how those work. Um, node features could be something like a binary representation or an atomic number or some other property. The weights could be distances or something else. We could include angles as additional um, complications. Um, there's other things that we can put into edge features like what are the, um, what's the distance or what are the properties of the nodes. And ultimately, this graph representation comes down to a modeling decision. There's not one right way. If you look in the literature, there's all sorts of different ways that people are applying this. Um, so when you read one of these papers, it is not just enough to say um, it's message passing or not. For the actual implementation, you also need to think about what is the actual graph that you're operating on and how do I apply that to my system? So this gets back to um, some of the questions about periodic boundary conditions and representations that I was talking about earlier. Um, one thing that you could do is you could look at your neighborhood and you could pull everything together and you can say, um, I wanna find everything nearby and I'm going to take all that information um, and everything that is within a certain distance or within a certain shell gets counted as a neighbor. That's the simplest approach. It's usually the fastest, it works pretty well. Um, but one problem with this approach is that if you have two different element types that have different atomic radii, it's not always super clear what you mean by a covalent bond or what the radius should be. So we can go from a element specific representation to something a little bit more general using um, an idea called a Voronoi tessellation, where we basically take the atomic structure, we create bounding boxes where the rules are, I am going to make a line based on the fact that it is um, equal distance between two points. So the top left blue line is equal to equidistant between the orange and the black. The left one is equidistant between the black and the red. Lower left is between the black and the green. And the Voronoi representation then is the area or the length of the polyhedra that forms one of those little um, edges says something about how much interaction there is between those two atoms. So um, in this case, the fact that there is a very large interaction between um, the black and the purple that's represented by the fact that the line between the black and the purple is very long compared to the line between the black and the red. This is also cool because if you did the same thing and you went out a little farther, there would be identically zero overlap between any of the other atoms in the system. So the idea of shielding is there. This is really a local system. Um, it allows you to say only what are the nearby neighbors and not the ones that are neighbors and neighbors. So that's cool. The downside um, is that these Voronoi methods tend to be a little bit more expensive. Um, depending on your system and how many of these you have to do, that can get um, a little bit slow and slow down your methods. The second question is, what do you do with the periodic boundary conditions? This is the same idea that I was talking about before. For a small molecule, it's pretty easy. Um, I just keep things as an undirected graph, no problem. When there's periodic boundary conditions, um, I can represent this in different ways. I need to take, it, um, take into account the fact that there's images of other atoms that I want to consider. And so um, I need to have multiple bonds. Um, in this example, the zero atom is bonded with the one atom and is also seeing the one atom one over. And so in the adjacency matrix, it would not just be a one, which would say that the two atoms are neighbors, it would be a two in that there's identically two different interactions between those, um, between those uh, unique atoms in the system. And so this representation um, I think is most rigorously called a mixed multigraph. 
This is the one that we're using for most of our representations now. Um, again, it is a modeling decision for these graph methods. Because these graph methods have done so well, there's been a lot of progress in this area and there's still a lot of competition to make these things more accurate. So one of the ones I wanted to highlight that I found especially impressive is this model called DimeNet, which is basically taking the idea of message passing, but allowing for directional message passing only. Um, at the same time, they also include spherical harmonics as their basis set. And um, the end result is that this model is getting quite a bit more complicated than the ones that we saw before, but the performance is really a lot better than the previous graph models. So um, as far as I know, this DimeNet model is, um, I would say, state of the art for small molecules and maybe also for materials, but that's a little bit less clear. Zach, just a heads up on time, yep. about 15 minutes left. Perfect, okay, thanks. Okay, okay. Um, I haven't talked a lot about materials so far. It's mostly been small molecules. If we wanna apply this to materials, then the um, additional things that we want to consider are how do we encode the element type? So a, I would say breakthrough in this area was this paper by Jeff Grossman's group um, called CGCNN. Uh, it's a very simple convolutional method. I would say so simple that I, maybe I shouldn't even call it a convolutional method, um, graph convolution method. Um, but the, the really key insight was to put node features in that were based on the elemental properties so that you didn't have to learn every unique combination of elements. Um, this really kickstarted a huge effort. This paper in 2018 has already gotten a huge number of citations. Um, there's a whole host of others that have tried to improve upon this. Um, things like um, papers called Improve CGCNN from um, Chris Wilberton's group. Same idea, but they improve the properties and they use Voronoi connectivity instead of real space distances. Um, Orbital field matrix representations from Amir Bharati for Armani's group here at CMU. Um, very similar idea, but instead they have interaction features based on the types of um, types of electrons in each of the types of elements. Um, this area is really making a lot of progress very quickly and it's helping these graph models extend to materials. One final note for these graph methods is that um, up until a couple of years ago, if you wanted to implement one of these, you had to do it from scratch in PyTorch or TensorFlow. There's now a whole library of PyTorch convolution operations called PyTorch Geometric. Um, a lot of the new ideas like DimeNet, InchNet, and others are getting implemented there. And that has, I think, made things a lot easier to um, compare and contrast. So if you're looking for a starting point and you know PyTorch, this is my recommendation for how to start playing around with these representations. The next type of representation I wanna talk about that I think is quite unique and I'm um, very excited about, but there haven't been very many examples of is orbital features. And the idea is that when I do a relatively cheap calculation, even a tight binding one, I have a lot of information about what happens. Um, I don't just get the final energy. I also get things like the um, orbital um, occupant, occupation for each of the electrons that I'm considering in the system. And those occupations and their structure and their shapes and everything else are all extremely physical features that you can use as a representation. So um, the best example I've seen of this is by Tom Miller's group at Caltech, um, published this year called OrbNet. They basically do a tight binding calculation in order to get some interesting features. Um, those features are then used to predict the difference between the type binding energy and the coupled cluster energy. And with that, um, they're able to get much better accuracy than just um, convolution operations on their own. This is really cool because it's taking advantage of um, other information from the models. The downside is you have to do a type binding calculation. So depending on your application, I would say either type binding is considered expensive or cheap. If you talk to the classical molecular mechanics people, they would say type binding is ridiculous and it's way too slow. If you talk to the couple cluster people, they would say, oh, type binding is no problem. It's still um, four orders of magnitude cheaper than my normal calculations. I'm perfectly happy to do that. Either way, I like the way that they're thinking about this, the idea that there's additional ways of representing these molecules besides just the nodes and atoms um, 
there's actually electronic things that are coming from the um, from the calculations themselves. Getting close to the end, um, the next thing I want to talk about is real space convolutions. Um, the idea is basically borrowed from image classification. There are huge models from Google and others on how to apply these um, uh, very, very dense, um, very, very deep neural networks to image problems. And the idea is basically, if we can apply this to images, why don't we try and apply it to molecules and materials as well? That's great. Um, the main benefit is there's a huge amount of literature you can build off of. The models are super fast. They're pre-trained things. Um, you don't have to do it from scratch. Google and Facebook and others have already made this super easy to try. The real question then is, what is an image of a molecule? What is the image of a material? So three applications that I've seen, um, one by Isaac Timblin's group at um, the NRC in Canada, um, Yashra Benjo's group, um, also in Canada from last fall, AJ Medford's group. Um, these are all different ways of thinking about um, how to make an image of a system. And then after you have this image, usually based on some sort of Gaussian density distribution, you apply a standard image convolution method and predict the final property. The idea is really interesting and the methods are fast to implement, but you often run into the same questions of um, that Tess was talking about, how do you encode things like rotational invariance? And so a lot of the difficulty is how do you augment your data enough or how do you enforce some other representation in order to make that possible? So that those are the major limitations right now. Um, as I said, Tess has already um, talked about this. If you're interested in this idea, um, I would basically look at her work on these Euclidean networks. It's really getting to the heart of how, what should the symmetries be? And she even uses um, some image examples in her presentation. Okay, um, unit cells and lattice vectors um, are an additional complication that also need to be brought up if you wanna design a periodic system. So it's not just enough to know where the atoms are connected. If I wanted to predict this from scratch and give this as an input to a DFT code, I would also need to encode things like the lattice constant of lattice angles or the, um, the symmetry of the system. And so there's been some recent work trying to actually encode that as well as part of the representation by um, Yu Sung Jung, Antonio Bonacici at MIT and others. Um, I really like this work because they're able to encode the crystal structure itself and they're able to use this to design and produce new, um, new molecules and new materials. Um, but this is something you have to think about if you're designing crystals. Um, this doesn't come up with the small molecule generative models. And this is one of the major um, issues with the representation that stop those generative models being used in materials. Okay, um, with the last few minutes, um, I just wanna talk a little bit about some automated methods to find and compare a lot of these different um, approaches. Um, and then talk a little bit about where I see some possible benefits. So um, if you have to start from scratch and try all these representations every time, um, you're never gonna make much progress unless you get lucky. And so um, just like Google and others are pushing things like AutoML for image recognition, there have been some recent attempts to try and make these things a little more automated so you can find the right representation without being an expert. Um, two examples that I'm aware of are one, Anubhav at LBL um, had a very nice paper this year talking about um, this auto map minor tool that will try a lot of different representations and a lot of different models and try and come with the best one. I found that it works very well for small data sets um, or simpler things. It is usually not super competitive yet with the inorganic large data sets, but I think it will improve as the models get more complicated. Schrodinger, which is a commercial company, has a tool called AutoQSAR, which they published on. Um, you can read a little bit more about it. Um, same idea, but applied to small molecule um, featureization techniques. I think tools like this are gonna become more important because right now, um, every time we try this um, with a new data set and type of representation, it's basically a PhD level project. Um, and so that, that really slows things down if that takes months or years every time you try a new, um, a new challenge. Um, and finally, I just wanna point out a couple of areas that I think are opportunities. Um, some of which we're working on, some of which I really wish someone would come along and just solve to make my life easier. So um, the first one I wanna point out is um, 
some of the most powerful methods in small molecules right now are based on natural language processing, as I talked about. The thing that's limiting that application to materials is that there's no grammar for crystals. So the first person to come along with something text-based, whatever it is, um, that encodes all of the interesting information about a crystal um, in a way that you can then apply all of the standard natural language processing techniques to generate new structures or whatever, um, that would open up a whole new suite of methods and kick off a ton of work. Um, I don't know how to do it. I think it's a hard problem. The fact that there's not a grammar is, um, says that the inorganic material people have already thought about this and been unsuccessful. But um, that would really be a step change and open up a new area of machine learning for materials. The graph methods, I think, are moving especially fast compared to all these others because the graph machine learning community is very large and very active right now, so we can benefit from what they're doing. This orbital idea is very cool. I haven't seen it applied to any materials, but I'm sure it's coming. Um, I think that would be super cool, and we need to find ways of using more information from these representations. And um, the final one is this idea of encoding unit cells and lattices. Um, there's been one demonstration that I talked about for materials. There hasn't been anything in surfaces or catalysis. Um, I think there's gonna be uh, more in materials as well. Um, this has really limited how we generate new materials. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity there to apply the same ideas um, to these other more interesting systems. Okay, um, finally, I just wanna highlight um, people who helped contribute to this. Um, so Javi and Brandon, um, Brandon's a postdoc here at um, NERSC on the NISA program in June. I'll help make some of the slides for this. So thanks, um, Javi, Brandon, and June. I also wanted to highlight Kevin, um, who's a PhD student in my group working on machine learning and catalysis, and he's um, planning to graduate this spring and is looking for positions. So get in touch if you're interested. Um, I also wanted to highlight um, four students who are applying for PhD positions this year since it's PhD application time. So um, Sudish, Sarab, Amish, and Richie are all awesome people who have been working on machine learning and materials. And so if you're interested in some of these ideas or machine learning potentials or whatever, um, feel free to shoot me an email and I'm happy to give you um, their info. Um, the community is pretty close knit and I'm really excited with how these things are going. There's been a lot of collaborative work. So um, hopefully this leads to more collaboration in the future. So with whatever time I have left, I am happy to answer some more questions. Um, otherwise, thanks for listening, and I am super excited to see so many people interested in deep learning and science. Thanks a lot, Zach. Looks like some questions are coming in. Again, if you want me to read them, I can. Otherwise, uh, you can see the Q&A. Um, okay, so the first question is, uh, what should the representation be for a classical MD simulation that's very large, like 20,000 water molecules in a box? Um, it's a great question. Um, in the classical MD codes, a lot of the work goes into long range forces like Leonard Jones and electrostatics. So if that is important, you need to be a little bit careful there. There are several different projects that I know of to try and implement neural network potentials into MD codes like LAMPS. So for the short range contribution, basically the, um, uh, the bond energies and the um, angular interactions, I don't see any reason that those shouldn't apply. Um, I find this very similar to reactive um, muscular dynamics potentials where um, those have worked relatively well for long time scale MD. Um, I think people are trying to do it. It's just very time intensive to take one of these machine learning codes and interface it with something like LAMPS. So um, the idea is good. I, I, if you're interested, shoot me an email and I'm happy to point you in the direction of some people working on this. Um, it's just a, a very time intensive process because um, you have to be very careful with the code. Um, the second question is on um, uh, the cutoff radius. And um, they mentioned that the, the typical cutoff radii for classical MD is 12 angstroms, um, but we're using um, seven or eight or maybe even lower in these unit cells. So what is the impact of this and what's the problem? Um, I think it's a great question. Um, I think one thing you have to consider is that you have to include a lot of information in that 12 angstroms. So 
Um, you can get by with a simple Leonard Jones potential as long as you know every other neighbor nearby. In this case, we have a little bit more information from these neural network potentials. It's not just a Leonard Jones, it also has some, some wiggles and other things. And so the fact that there's correlations with what that function should look like and what happens one coordination level out means that we can sometimes get by with a shorter cutoff than you would use an MD. A lot of the systems that people are training on, van der Waals has not been super important. So for most of the catalysis examples, um, the DFT codes themselves don't even include van der Waals. So if I'm running RPBE calculations, um, I don't need a 12 angstrom cutoff radius because the DFT doesn't even have that in there. As soon as you go to a system where van der Waals is important, things like you say a large water box or larger unit cells, or um, large molecules on a surface or less covalent interactions, you probably need Leonard Jones and Van der Waals and you probably need a larger cutoff. Um, that's the direction where people are pushing. Um, and I think there's gonna be progress, but it's really come from the fact that most people have chosen specifically much simpler systems where you wouldn't have this problem. Um, we all know it's an issue. Um, we just haven't gotten there yet. All righty, uh, I don't see any more questions at the moment. Um, uh, I don't know if you need to run to another thing just in case any more come in, but um, I, I do at least wanna, given that it's 11, uh, thank you very much, Zach, for this fantastic presentation. Great overview of a lot of the activities going on in this space. A lot of good stuff and good references to follow up on. Um, and with that, actually, that brings us to the end of the Deep Learning for Science 2020 program. So just very briefly, I want to uh, thank everyone who contributed and attended the webinars. I think we had a lot of really fantastic speakers, great material. Um, the attendees were engaged and had a lot of great questions. Uh, we do hope to be able to get back to an in-person event next year, but of course, stay tuned for uh, announcements on that. Um, one, we, one more special thanks to Mustafa. He wasn't able to join today, but he was really the, the one driving the organization of this event. Uh, did the majority of the work putting together the program and did a great job. So uh, thanks to Mustafa and uh, the rest of us. Well, we'll be still on Slack, so feel free to continue using that workspace to discuss the material or related deep learning for science topics. And we hope to hope to see you next time.